Hello, uh, this time we have a great, great uh, guest. Uh, this is Professor Paul Levinson. Um, we studied in the same program, very innovative program called Media Ecology at NYU many, many years ago. And um, he uh, uh, is going to share with us uh, this evening um, his experience with uh, another great uh, professor and uh, teacher, Professor Yosef Yoske uh, Agassi, um, uh, an Israeli professor, but uh, Paul Levinson uh, knew him and uh, it is exactly a year since, since Professor Agassi uh, died and uh, uh, we all miss him. And uh, uh, it's unbelievable that I'm going to find out about him and you can listen to that with me uh, from a, an old friend in New York uh, who uh, knew a lot about Agassi that I didn't know. So this is going to be very exciting. And uh, so uh, instead of me telling you about uh, Professor Paul Levinson, uh, I will let him tell us about um, himself, especially what is relevant for uh, the audience of status of our management magazine. So Paul, thank you so much for uh, accepting our invitation. Uh, this is great, I'm very excited. So um, tell us a bit, a bit about yourself. You have a very, very impressive career. And um, I suggest that uh, uh, all of you will look later uh, to find out all the details, but what you think is mostly relevant to the audience of status would be lovely uh, if you could share with us. Thank you, Paul. Well, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here. Joseph Agassi was a very special person in my life, and I look forward to talking to you about him. But as far as I'm concerned, I'm a person who, ever since I was a little kid, if I was really enjoying something, I would very soon also want to help create and produce that. And I guess it's a good thing for the world that I didn't enjoy nuclear physics. Otherwise, I probably would have blown up the whole world by now. <laughs> but, but one of the things that I very much enjoyed was music, you know, rock and roll music in the 1950s, the Beatles in the 1960s. So a whole part of my life has been making music. Uh, and uh, actually, that has a connection to the media ecology program, uh, because uh, one of my classmates, who is actually a year ahead of me, Robert Blackman, put lyrics to a song. It was called the Media Ecology Song. And at the Media Ecology Conferences, we would actually sing that and other songs. In any case, I have a couple of albums out. Uh, Twice Upon a Rhyme came out in 1972. And uh, I waited 50 years to uh, come up with my second album called Welcome Up, Songs of Space and Time. Not because I was so shy, but I was trying to build up an audience. Anyway, uh, I'm going to be going back into the studio uh, in a couple of months to record a third album with a company called Old Bear Records. Totally in addition to that, uh, I'm a science fiction author. And, and that's actually a lot of fun. Uh, by the way, much more fun than scholarship because you don't have to get footnotes or references <laughs> And so uh, I'm probably almost as well known as a science fiction author as I am a scholarly writer. In fact, though, 
most of my science fiction novels are available only in English. Uh, this is in contrast to my scholarly writing, which has been translated into, I think, 16, 17 languages. By the way, not yet into Hebrew. So if anybody is watching this, you know, I, I have all the rights to them so I can give uh, you permission to translate them. And believe it or not, one of my books, New New Media, has even been translated into Arabic. And uh, so, uh, it's, uh, you know, I'm, uh, it's been translated into Chinese, uh, you know, Japanese. I, I don't read most of those languages, so I can only hope that they translated it accurately. Because, you know, I, there's a story about Karl Popper that we'll be talking about where they translated some of his books uh, in the Soviet Union into Russian. And they basically took out every single one of Popper's criticisms of Karl Marx. <laughs> All they, <laughs> in, in Popper's book, The Open Society, were his, you know, critiques of Plato and Aristotle. So, um so I promise that uh, we will explore opportunities to translate uh, one of your books into Hebrew. <laughs> oh, great, great, great. Um, and then in addition to all that, I'm a professor. And, you know, it's probably already clear to our uh, listeners that I enjoy talking. And uh, people often ask me, well, hey, when are you going to retire? And I'm going to say, are you kidding? Where else can I get a room full of bright young people who are listening to my every word and uh, making sure they get it right? So uh, I've been teaching at Fordham University for, I guess, about 22 years now. Uh, and uh, I'm going to continue teaching there a a as long as I can. Um, but I am... Uh, Really glad that uh, you're so interested in Joseph Agassi. And I'll just tell you as sort of an introduction to how I came to know Joseph Agassi. In the PhD program, the Media Ecology program, in which uh, Neil Postman was my mentor, Christine Nystrom was uh, on my doctoral committee, uh, and by the way, I will say also, just so people know, I love Neil, and he was the most inspiring teacher I ever had. However, I disagreed with just about all of his criticisms of technology. I think he was far too much of a pessimist. In fact, if Neil were alive today, and he heard and saw what we were now doing, he would say, what's the matter with you? This is just another form of television. You know, it, it, it's going <laughs> to hurt people's understanding, not help them. So I, I tried in vain to, uh, you know, convince him, uh, but I, I didn't uh, succeed. But he was a wonderful teacher. And, and as you know, one of the uh, uh, people that he introduced us to during the uh, doctoral program, fairly briefly, but, you know, significantly, was Karl Popper the philosopher and i you know of course, i course because he was my teacher too that's and this right. is how i got to uh, to agassi and how i got to you now <laughs> yeah, that's that's exactly right and um you know i'm the kind of person also when i find something that i you know really like and love you know, in a book or a movie or whatever, I want to read and see and, and listen to everything else I can get my hands on. And by the way, back then, obviously, in the late 1970s, early 1980s, it wasn't as easy as it is now, because you had to go out and buy the books and so on. You, you know, there was no way you could just, you know, in your house, just see any movie or television show that you wanted to. So I began, you know, looking into Agassi, and uh, when I uh, finished the PhD program uh, and, and and got my PhD, that was 1979. Uh, there were two things that I did. First, I wrote an article uh, about uh, Marshall McLuhan. It was published in the Journal of Communication. It was called McLuhan and Rationality. And then, and tragically, McLuhan uh, passed away at a way too young age uh, in, in 1980. 
but the other thing I got very interested in was Karl Popper's work. And I, I began uh, reading all of his uh, work, not just objective knowledge and not just the open society and its enemies, but he had another book, Conjectures and Refutations. And I got to know some of Karl Popper's students. I didn't know them personally, but by their work. And again, I'm the kind of person I really, uh, you know, fell in love with this uh, philosophy. I mean, it just seemed to me that Popper's view that you can't ever know everything 100% accurately. And in fact, the only way you can advance your knowledge is to try to identify things that you know are not true and take them off the table. I found that made a lot of sense. It was very appealing. And before too long, I came up with an idea. Uh, why don't I put together a collection of essays uh, on Karl Popper's work? And if you think about it, this was a pretty arrogant thing for me to do. But as I'm sure you already know, and anyone else who knows me, I'm a pretty arrogant person. I have like total <laughs> confidence in anything that I want to do. And um, so I put together a list of people that uh, I thought would be good uh, people to contribute their ideas in the form of an essay for this book, In Pursuit of Truth. Pretty soon, somebody said- I to love me, the Taiki, by the way. Wow, <laughs> great Taiki. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And um, I, I didn't know this, but somebody said, well, you know, 1982 will be Popper's 80th birthday. So why don't you make this not just an anthology of essays, but an anthology that's a fesh shrift, uh, a book published in honor of Popper's 80th birthday. I said, OK, that, that's a great idea. And uh I had had experiences, you know, going around to record companies for my work in, in the music business. I hadn't yet started writing science fiction. I had had some, a few articles published, but I had never gone to any uh, book publisher. And I found out about this relatively small press, Humanities Press. Uh, the headquarters were in, were in Atlantic Highlands, New Jersey. That's like a little beach town. It's a beautiful place, but the last place you'd expect to find a publisher. And uh, the the uh, the owner of the, uh, of the place, a uh, nice Jewish guy by the name of Simon Silverman, loved the idea of uh, a, a book of essays, a fresh shift on Karl Popper. And so the book became a reality and I began writing to people and contacting people who I knew had, you know, a, 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 an important thing or more than one important thing to say about Popper. I, I had already at that point read a great book that Joseph Agassi had written uh, with his son back in the 1960s in which, you know, it's like a conversation in which his son is asking him questions and, and, and Agassi is answering them. And, and I already knew that Agassi was a, not only a brilliant thinker, but a very talented writer, you know, someone who got right to the point. And what I didn't know, however, and what you and I were talking about uh, you know, before we started this interview, that by the time I had written to Agassi, uh, he was no longer on even speaking terms with Karl Popper. And so when he responded to my written request, I sent out to him saying, hey, I'm putting together a fresh rift of, you know, uh, essays about Karl Popper's work. You've done some really important work in that area yourself. How would you like to contribute an essay? The first thing he said to me in the letter that he wrote back to me was, uh, well, are you sure you want me to write something? Karl Popper himself would be very angry that uh, you included my essay uh, in, the, in this book. And my response was, Karl Popper will be angry? Great. You know, he believes in wow. he, he believes in criticism. This is exactly uh, <laughs> what we want. <laughs> and so, you know, he he uh, I guess he wrote a, a great essay for the book. And, and I should mention, by the way, 
I, I this, I mean, it sounds a little bit uncharitable, but it's very true. It wasn't hard to make Karl Popper angry. I mean, everyone, <laughs> everyone gets angry. And uh, also, as you and I were talking before, it's sort of ironic that someone who philosophically shined a spotlight on criticism as a way that knowledge grows. And in fact, uh, Donald Campbell wrote a very important essay called Evolutionary Epistemology, in which Campbell made the connection between the, the intellectual winnowing and removal of wrong ideas, a connection between that and natural selection in biological evolution itself, because that's how life evolves. Organisms that don't work that well, organisms that have characteristics that don't work too well in the environment, usually over a period of time, the new uh, versions of them are created through mutation, and those are the ones that uh, survive. And I guess that's how we human beings arose from the great apes. Um, and, uh, you know, not to get too much off into current events now, we're not doing a very good job, however, you know, certainly in the 20th century and right now of surviving, of protecting the planet, etc., which, by the way, is one of the reasons why I want us to get out into space and beyond this planet, because I think that ultimately that is the future of humanity. But, um, you know, getting back to Papa, he, in fact, was allergic to any kind of criticism. And, I, and I'm sure you and, I'm, uh, you know, our listeners will uh, find this very, very uh familiar whenever you write something whenever you come up with an idea you know for me whenever it's a song or a science fiction story or an idea for a book i want everyone who looks at to say oh my god it's the most wonderful thing in the world there's absolutely nothing wrong with it i want to publish this immediately you deserve a nobel prize congratulations that <laughs> that's that's what every author wants right and and it is painful when someone says well, hey, you know, it's good here, but it has a problem there. So on, on a personal level, nobody likes criticism, but m most people find uh, if they stick with it, that actually criticism helps them improve their work. I, 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 there was an article in Time magazine, uh, I'm sorry, in Science magazine I saw years ago. It was actually not an article, a letter to the editor. A scientist was writing... Uh, to Science Magazine, he had contributed an article that they had published about a year earlier. And what he was saying in this letter is, uh, the, the, the Science Magazine was good enough to publish like nine or 10 letters in response to my article. And I have to tell you, when I first read the letters, I was delighted with all the praise that I got but I was really furious about this one article with this one letter that took my article apart. The nerve of that person. They didn't understand <laughs> anything I said. And but I decided to say, but now I have to tell you a year later, I read that letter again. And although it didn't make me happy, I realized that I could have communicated what I wanted to say a bit more clearly because it wasn't just this other scientist's fault that he found and misunderstood, in fact, part of my uh, essay. It was because I, the writer, was not clear enough when I wrote the essay. And I remember thinking, that's a great example of what Karl Popper was saying. But b because Popper had that attitude, he, he got angry at me in, in that fast shrift in Pursuit of Truth in the introduction. Uh, Karl Popper said something like, uh, the atom bomb uh, has falsified philosophy. And what he was trying to say uh, by that was, you can have all the philosophy in the world, but if you have atomic weapons, you can blow up the world and it doesn't matter what the philosophy was. I thought it was a very good point that he, he had made. He got furious when he saw that because I didn't okay with him. And he said, you, you should have explained this more. This makes me sound like a warmonger. What do you mean? This is Karl Popper. You, you know, the atom bomb falsified. <laughs> so I understand. By the way, Agassi used to talk about 
the uh, danger created by science, of course, the bomb. Uh, so it's interesting that you mention it now. Yeah. Yeah, and look, these problems, they don't go away. And, um, you know, one of the problems, you know, that the, the movie Oppenheimer, uh, yes. or, you know, what, what do you do in, in a case like that? Um, I, I'm glad that I wasn't Harry Truman, the president of the United States, and I had to make that decision. Because on the one hand, you know, Japan was the one that attacked the United States. The United States pleaded with Japan to surrender at that point in the war. Japan refused. So from Harry Truman, the president's point of view, he he was going to have to sacrifice X number of American soldiers in order to finally get Japan out of the war. And the atom bomb would do that with just and it didn't even do that with the first bomb. It took two atom bombs. But on the other hand, so many innocent people were killed and um in japan and um you know th these problems uh, you know get it at the very paradoxical nature of of human beings we uh yeah. on the one hand we're capable of great love great empathy but on the other hand you know we get involved in wars and uh you know, it doesn't get any better. Anytime there's a low, you think, I mean, I, I'm sure between, I'm sure like in the mid 1920s, you know, ne neither of us were alive then. We were almost alive then, but neither of us were alive <laughs> in the mid 1920s. But I, I'm sure a lot of people were saying, okay, World War One is over, you know, okay, we learned our lesson. And of course, you know, within a few years, there was even a worse war. And, um, and I think, you know, getting back to Joseph Agassi, he was somebody, you know, the uh, philosophers have the wrong reputation of having their heads in the clouds and not being interested in practical problems. Joseph Agassi triumphed in applying philosophy to practical issues, and he was one of the most sensible uh, people I've ever uh, known. So do you have some uh, memory from talking to him about an issue or any story, any anecdote from your relationship with him around his uh, article, uh, which he contributed to the uh, 80th birthday book <laughs> of Karl Popper? Uh, some specific stories. Yeah. That you can share. Okay. I'll tell you a couple of stories. So we became friends. And um, shortly after the book was published, um, and for some reason, a lot of these stories took place in, in the summer. So I got three or four really good stories. Uh, my wife and I, actually, we still go up to Cape Cod every year. Uh, our daughter bought a house on Cape Cod, and we also rent the cottage right by the, the water. And I have a Joseph and Judith Agassi story about them visiting us on Cape Cod that I'll tell you in a moment. Oh, but, wow. Yeah. But before that happened, one of the first times I, I met Joseph Agassi, we come back, uh, it's like the end of August from Cape Cod, and, and Joseph Agassi, uh, I, I, I guess, calls and says, hey, how you doing? And I said, fine. He says, well, you know, uh, I'm, I'm here uh, in, in New York City. You know, I'm usually up in Boston. Why don't we get together? And I said, okay, sure. And he gives me his address in Queens, okay? Now, I don't know if you, probably some of you listeners know New York and how you get from one place to another. Manhattan is fairly logically laid out. It has streets, you know, you can get around. Uh, Queens is completely insane. It, it, it basically, they, they have streets, avenues, and boulevards that all have the same name, but they're different you know, streets. We they used don't... to live there when oh. I studied with Neil Postman. Sure. So, you know, no. so, I mean, I, I, so bear in mind, this now is, I guess, uh, this is after In Pursuit of, uh, of Truth is published, so it's probably like, you know, 1983, 1984. 
Uh, and uh, I, I drive out to Queens, and there's no, we don't have GPS. I have a no. map. <laughs> I'm desperate. There, and also, there are no cell phones or smartphones. I can't call anyone. I drove around for about three hours, and <laughs> I couldn't find his place. You know, so, you know, so my first meeting with uh, Joseph Agassi didn't happen in person. Oh. So I couldn't find where he was. And <laughs> I, I call him. Um, and he says, oh, look, no problem. It's a little difficult to find. And I say, well, great. Thanks for telling me now, you know. <laughs> and uh, But that just goes to show you there's a moral to that story. Don't let things like that get in the way of your relationship with people. The, the if Physical meetings are always more difficult than they might seem to be, you know, especially if you don't know where the person is living, et cetera. So if I had been a different kind of person, I would have said, you know what, I forget about this Agassi. He gave me an incorrect address. I wasted like three hours trying and to find him, you know, I have his uh, essay ready for in pursuit of truth. I'm, I'm not going uh, to waste any more time with him. <laughs> but I knew that it was also my fault because I, you know, I, you know, it was a combination of basically Queens and me just not finding his address. So we actually did meet um, a little uh, after that at a, um, it turned out that he was a couple of months later, uh, talking at a conference which was just it was taking place uh literally we now live in white plains new york we used to live in in the bronx but it's like about a 15 minute ride from the bronx to white plains so uh the the conference was in white plains i i went up to white plains uh and uh, met him in fact now this is coming back to me our son Simon uh, was then just a little baby. And uh, so this would have been 1984. Um, and uh, in, in fact, uh, Simon was born in 1983, so he's now 40 years old. So I'm sure you've had the same with, with your son, your own. I mean, this seems insane to me that I have a son who's 40 years old. I mean, that that's totally impossible since as far as I'm concerned, I, I actually think I'm 19 years old. You know, <laughs> that's on a bad day. On a good day, I even feel like I'm 17. So what am I doing <laughs> And he has two wonderful boys, you know, so uh, I'm a grandfather now. But uh, so so actually, Simon doesn't remember it, but we tell him about the time that he met Joseph uh, Agassi. Um, but I'll tell you a couple of other Joseph Agassi uh, things. So a year later, we're, we're on Cape Cod and now Cape Cod is not that far from Boston. And I say, and I say, and you know, again, we had phones then, obviously. So I called Joseph and I say, why don't you and Judith come down, visit us uh, at this cottage we have? And it was one of the most wonderful times. It was magical. I just regret that I didn't take any photographs of it. But again, now it's so easy to take a photograph. If you yes. have a phone, you take a photograph take a selfie, you have somebody take it for you. Back then, I would have had to take a camera, and it just didn't occur to me. Anyhow, I went for a walk on the beach uh, with uh, Joseph and Judith, and it was uh, uh, just like a perfect uh, place to be. Just imagine this, a nice, quiet beach, you know, late in the afternoon. The sun had not yet uh, set. Uh, it, it was not too hot. The water was like splashing at our feet. At one point, we even like walked out into the bay, uh, the, the place that we were in and still go to the, the cottage on the beach is on the bay. So the water goes out as far as two miles. And at one point, I mean, after we had been talking, the three of us and my wife, Tina, was there, then we went back and Joseph uh and Judith said, we're going to go for a walk, you know, on the beach uh, ourselves out into the water. And so Tina and I walked back to our cottage and we turned around and, you know, I still have this picture in my head, a beautiful picture of Joseph and Judith walking slowly out into the receding water. And the sun is like beginning to set and they're holding hands. And we were just looking at them. Wow. It was such a sweet, beautiful uh, moment. 
Um, I mean, what kind you of... You know that our group, the Joseph Agassi group, started when he was still alive. After he lost his wife, by the way, you must know that she was the uh, granddaughter right. of Martin Buber. Yes. A, yeah. And and a, a scientist still says. Um, yeah. I, I met her many years ago when I first uh, went to uh, get some response from him to some questions that my friends overseas uh, sent me to talk to him. You know, I never studied philosophy, so I... I didn't feel um, um, proper to to keep on, you know, getting in touch with him. I I I regret it, but that's the fact. So in any case, he um, was uh, he became a a widower, and um, uh, some of his students. Um, felt that uh, they need to do something and they suggested that they should come once in a while and have a conversation with him. And uh, they uh, came every uh, Friday and it evolved or co-evolved if we talk uh, the language of uh, evolution. Um, uh, into a meeting in which every time somebody else makes a presentation for one hour and the other hour uh, there is a conversation. And um, uh, it lasted all the way till his death. And uh, then they decided that that's the best way to keep meeting. And so... Um, we are lucky that even though uh, the two of us were lucky to have met him and uh, talked to him and interview him uh, face to face, which is, you know, amazing, um, that uh, we now get to meet his students and to listen to their stories, just as uh, we listen uh, to you um, now in, in this uh, interview. Amazing. Um, the love story between the two of them was really something else. Amazing. Amazing. So so now back to your stories and your memories. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's just a couple of other you know, of the many, many uh, you know, times I had with him. Um, one of my close friends, and you you know who he is, Joshua Myrowitz. And he, sure. yeah, so Josh and I were in the same media ecology uh, class. He and I basically dominated the class. Uh, you know, there are other good people in the class as well. Um, but, and, and we've remained, you know, friends over the years. So uh, there was another conference i can't quite remember where the conference was it was it was somewhere in the united states it was either new york or boston so anyway so i'm at the conference uh with tina uh joshua meyerowitz is at the conference with uh his then wife candy leonard and jo joseph and judith are at the conference also and uh, so it was, it was pretty so good. So what type of conference was it? Uh, it Did I, he attend media ecology conferences? No, it was not a media <laughs> conference. I, you know, it would have been a brilliant idea to, to have him uh, there, but uh, it was not a media ecology conference. It might have been something like the American Association for the Advancement of Science. I, oh, uh, okay. I, you know, something like that, uh, which, by the way, was more than just science. They had conferences on philosophy and so on. Anyway, so here are the six of us talking. And um, then a couple of other people come by. I don't remember quite who they are. And <laughs> Joseph is uh, is introducing us and to these other people. And remember, uh, you know, I told you that by this point, so this is like now the mid to late 1980s, I already had an album out in 1972, Twice Upon a Rhyme. I sent a copy of the album to Joseph Agassi. 
that's how much I appreciate his opinion. And he told me that he loved it. And, you know, it was very... Uh, he loved music. Yes, he that's right. He loved music. Yeah. That's right. I mean, he was like thrilled. He, he And actually, he was... I don't know whether I should be flattered or not about this. He probably was more impressed with my music than he was with my philosophic writing. So, <laughs> yeah. so we're at, at this conference, like the six of us and there are a couple other people come by and we're talking. And so Agassi is introducing uh, people and Agassi introduces me to a couple other people says, this is Paul Levinson. I, uh, I had a, uh, an essay in his uh, fascia for Karl Popper in pursuit of truth. He's also a rock and roll star, blah, 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 blah. So Candy Leonard, Josh's wife, who has a sharp tongue, if you ever interview her, she'll probably remember this. She said, says, he's not a rock and roll star. You know, he, he had an album out that doesn't make him a star. <laughs> so I was just laughing. But Gassy took her on. He said, well, it's a great album. You know, if he isn't totally a star, he'll be be a star someday and he wasn't just you know kidding he really you know, had had this belief in the album so who would have expected that this you know philosopher who many people even back then regarded as a curmudgeon you know somebody who was just you know a crank and all he did was criticize people would defend me and my music to you know to josh myrowitz's wife who actually was telling the truth i wasn't a rock and roll star i just had an album out but, but he I, I, was very kind you know yeah. that he used to wait for us next to his home when we came to uh, to to have an interview with him. And he was already 94 years old and he was waiting for us outside. And then when we finished, he used to come with us to the car again. He was amazing, just amazing. Uh, let's explore a bit. Um, uh, how you see uh, the sustainability of uh, uh, these two philosophers, Karl Popper and Agassi. Um, I uh, remember that he used to criticize Wittgenstein or Wittgenstein. And I remember that Neil Postman used to talk to us about Wittgenstein and I didn't remember that Postman criticize Wittgenstein. But since I'm not an, an expert in philosophy, uh, and since we do talk about evolution, and it seems that you are more of an expert than I am um, in philosophy, um, what is the evolution? Where are they now in this evolution, Popper and Agassi? Well, in the in the evolution of our world and 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 their uh, philosophy, first of all, you know one of the most important things about ideas that we human beings come up with uh, is they always have unpredictable trajectories. It's almost impossible to predict. You know, David Hume, the great British philosopher. You know, his his book uh, on human understanding, I think it's called, as he put it, uh, it was born, stillborn from the press, meaning nobody said a word about it. You know, for years, people ignored it. And eventually it became w one of the foundations of philosophy that anyone who studies pretty much any serious philosophy, you're going to read David Hume sooner or later. So uh, as far as, you know, uh, Karl Popper and and Joseph Agassi and you know m many of his uh, students and by the way let me also mention here uh, I, and I don't want to forget to say this someone who I also knew very well I don't know if you ever met Ian Jarvie was a that's J A R V I E he and Agassi were very close friends and when Popper began really savagely attacking Agassi, saying, I don't want to talk to him. His philosophy is worthless. He's just trying to upstage me. And again, this was, was Popper. And, um, you know, I, 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 yet another one of his students, 
uh, w. William Bartley, Bill Bartley, who died at a very young age, I think, you know, back maybe in the 1990s, um, the essay that he contributed for In Pursuit of Truth was called A Difficult Man. And he was talking about Karl Popper. And he talked even about Popper's, uh, you know, antagonism to Agassi just because Agassi had criticized him. But anyway, I do want to mention, before I get back specifically to, to Popper and, and Agassi, um, Ian Jarvey uh, tragically died uh, in June 2023. And, and he and Agassi were so close uh, that when Jarvey died, uh, I was thinking, well, in, in a sense, I'm, I'm terribly sorry that he died, but in a way, the two of them are going to be together because, I mean, it's sort of interesting the way life works out. Joseph Agassi dies in January 2023. Ian Jarvey probably among the Popperians, his closest and best friend, and they actually wrote a whole bunch of books together and edited a bunch of books together, d dies in June. And... Uh, 2023. And by the way, let me also mention, in case anyone is interested, as I'm sure is well known, Agassi taught at many universities, but in in the in the maybe middle to uh, three or four decades of his life, he had a joint appointment at York University in Toronto and Tel Aviv University in Israel. The appointment that he had that uh, Agassi had was at, at York University was 100% because of Ian Jarvey, uh, because Jarvey was a Canadian. Actually, I think he was originally a Brit, but then he moved to Canada. And and he invited his close friend, um, Joseph Agassi. And, uh, you know, I uh, love uh, the education that I got, but uh, a part of me will always regret, gee, I wish I had gone up when I was a little younger to York University to take courses with these guys. <laughs> you know, that, would, that would have been a fabulous um, thing. Um, let me just tell you, though, another, just to show that Agassi is a human being. He wasn't always in a good mood. He was a human being like all of us. You know, we have highs, we have lows. So this is a good, I don't know, you know, I can never remember, but this is probably, I would say maybe the early 1990s already, you know, 92, 93, 94. So I have a cousin by the name of Zachary, who is also Zachary Thatcher is his name. And by the way, he is a, a great supporter of Israel. And uh, he, he's written some wonderful articles, uh, which I have always, you know, shared and recommended to people in, in which he, he correctly attacks, frankly, the American idiots who don't understand who, who started, you know, this war in Israel and what needs to be done. You know, how, how can they expect how, how can anybody live in a country where just a few miles from you, you have these maniacs who, who did what they did? So um, so he, Zachary, to this day, is a writer. He always had a great interest in philosophy. So this is also one of my favorite Agassi stories. So now this is, um, let's just say it's 1993, okay? So our son Simon is 10 years old. And Zachary, I think, was born, you know, I don't know, like maybe like in the early 1970s or something. So Zachary is like maybe like 20, 21, 22. And, you know, a young man with a lot of ideas. And he, Zachary, and, you know, my sister-in-law and their family, they live in Boston. So we're up there visiting them you know, maybe for Thanksgiving or something. And I have the brain, and I'm and I'm talking about Popper and Agassi. You know what it was? I'll tell you, actually, believe it or not. it We ha we were having a Seder up there. Now it's coming back to me. And so, you know, what do you do at Seder? Sometimes you talk about, you know, you talk philosophy at Seder. It's fascinating. By the way, I just want to mention here, in case our listeners are interested, my my, my favorite part of the Seder, my favorite song is Eliyahu Anavi. Hey, Eliyahu Anavi. And the reason that's my favorite song is it's science fiction. How can one person be everywhere at the same time? <laughs> so God knows how many thousands of years ago they wrote a great science fiction story. It wasn't called science fiction, but that's what it is. It's a science fiction. It's a wonderful story. So you know, we're, we're talking about philosophy and 
I, I probably said, you know, after the Seder, you know, there's a great philosopher who lives here in Boston. And it was Zachary who said, well, I, you know, I'd like to meet him. And I said, well, you know, Simon already met him, but he was just a few months old. No doubt Simon doesn't remember him. And then Simon pipes up, well, I do actually remember him a little because I was there when he visited us on Cape Cod. And I said, yeah, that's right. So uh, I call up a guy and say, hey, uh, how about I come over and, you know, say hello to you with my son. He'd love to see you again. And my nephew, Zachary Thatcher, who, by the way, he, even, even then, he was like a very serious young man, you know, in his 20s, very interested in philosophy. Anyway, so we go visit Agassi at his house in Cambridge and we're sitting around, you know, having tea. And Zachary is like asking Agassi all kinds of questions. And Agassi is just not in the mood to talk philosophy, whatever he's in the mood for. We're talking current <laughs> events. And Zachary keeps coming back. But, you know, what do you think about the mind body problem? And, you know, what, what about this? And he probably even mentioned Wittgenstein and blah, blah, blah. And finally, Agassi said, I'm not in the mood to talk about this now. So that's, you know, so we, we talked about other things. We left and Zachary said to me on the way back to my sister-in-law's house, boy, what a disappointment that was. I thought I was going to have a conversation. <laughs> You were a serious philosopher. All he wanted to talk about is current events. I said, well, listen, philosophers are more than just their minds. They're human beings, you know, just like anyone else. They, they, you might have wanted to talk about it, but he wanted to talk about something else. But that was a very important lesson also. But, but you know, it's interesting that uh, usually he loved questions. That's right. We had to come to him with questions. I would prepare questions for him. Uh, we would pick a topic and then I would come with questions and ask him. And by the way, I was inspired by him because he used to come to class and not to start teaching, but to wait for the students who are to ask him questions. And if they didn't have questions, he would put some classical music on <laughs> till somebody would come up with a question. It's amazing. Uh, do you have any insights since the two of us, you and I, we are media ecologists. Uh, we studied with the same teacher. He was my mentor too, Neil Postman, uh, for my dissertation. So, um, uh, do you have any insights about ideas from media ecology that resonate with uh, the philosophy of Popper and or Agassi? Because after all, I cannot ask Postman why he decided to include Popper or in the body of knowledge of media ecology. So, um, I can only ask you because you kind of studied it much more than I did. Yeah. That, that's a great question. And uh, oh, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. The answer in two words is Henry Perkinson. And, oh, he was on my committee. Okay, so there you go. And he, by the way, first of all, I just love, before I even met him, I loved his name. Henry Perkinson, it sounds like a nice cup of coffee, doesn't it? You know, he <laughs> like opened up like a coffee shop or something. <laughs> Henry Perkinson. So I liked him even before I met him. Um, but it's important to remember about Neil, that Neil, before he was a media ecologist, was a, in effect, a philosopher of education. And what was his first book that he wrote with Charlie Weingartner? Teaching as a... Uh, subversive activity. By the way, that was the postman that I totally agreed with. When he wrote teaching as a uh, conserving activity, that's when I began disagreeing with him because uh, in general, I prefer subversive to you know conservative. But um, so Neil had this you know profound interest in, in education. And as a matter of fact, as you know, the media ecology 
doctoral program was in the NYU School of Education, uh, not in the whatever the name is of the, just their general graduate school. So that's why Neil was teaching there. And that's why Henry Perkinson was teaching there. And the two of them became very, very good friends. And I got to know Henry very well off also. And by the way, Henry Perkinson is a rarity, was a rarity, sadly he's no longer with us, in the academic world. He was the sweetest person you know, in the academic world. Even when he didn't like someone, he would still, you know, or even when he couldn't stand somebody's ideas, he would be the most courteous, gentle person in the world. So he was a real sweetheart. And the way that Neil got interested in Karl Popper, and therefore the way I did and you did and how I found out about Agassi and all of that, and, and what led really to in pursuit of truth, uh, is... Um, Henry Perkinson, in his, he, he wrote like, I don't know, about eight or nine or even 10 different books about education. And uh, it turns out that uh, although Perkinson didn't study under uh, Popper, he, Perkinson, was a Popperian. He, he agreed 100% with falsification. He agreed 100%, you know, the, the, the arrogance of of seeking certainty, you know, the, the arrogance of thinking that you have the right answer and we don't have to do any more thought or research. And in fact, he applied and he was, I, I suppose other people did it as well, but I'm not familiar with them. But in his books, Henry Perkinson quite explicitly applied Popper's philosophy to the classroom, to education. You know, how do you stimulate uh, d discussion? Y you encourage your students to tell you, the professor, what's wrong with your philosophy. And this is, or whatever theory it is you are uh, presenting. And by the way, again, it, it's just sort of occurring to me as we're talking, here's a similarity between Postman and Popper, because I actually, as a student, and then after I had my PhD, tried to do that with Neil. I try, I was criticizing what I thought was his overly pessimistic view of the media. And he eventually got angry at me. You know, not, uh -huh. not maybe as angry as uh, Popper did at Agassi, but this is a common uh, thing. By the way, I never get angry when people, you know, criticize me as long as they spell my name right when they criticize me. That's like an old W.C. Fields joke. You can say whatever you want about me as long as you spell my name right. But the truth is, and I hate to even say this because this sounds too much like Donald Trump, but you know, even a, even a clock is right twice a day, even a broken clock, if it's just stuck on one thing, is right twice a day. You know, Trump famously has said the worst publicity is no publicity. And that's why Trump actually is thrilled with all of these indictments and these trials that he's now facing, because it keeps his name in the headlines. But I think he is right that if you are a person who you have ideas and you've written things, you've created things, and you want the world to know about that, Yes, you do. You, like like I was saying before, you want people to say, oh, I love this. This is so wonderful. This changed my life for the better, blah, 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 blah. But far better than nothing at all or people not talking about your work is someone saying, well, hey, I read Levinson's book and you know what? He got it all wrong. Levinson is just an unbridled optimist. He doesn't realize the damage that the Internet is doing, you know. By the way, I, I, you can't make this stuff up. One of my best known novels is called The Plot to Save Socrates. And uh, basically the, the, the hero of the novel is actually a, a, a sexy young uh, graduate student woman by the name of Sierra Waters. She travels back in time. I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna give the whole story away. Just about a week or two ago, I, I mean, I'm not making this up. People can look at it. Uh, if you uh, go to uh, Amazon and you look at the you know, reviews there, you'll see a review. It's a five-star review. That's the best review you can get of sure. the plot. Okay. And here, but here's what the text of the review says in this five-star review. It says something like, 
this is a very good book if you're interested, you know, in ancient Greece and Athens, you know, and, and the classical era. And, you know, uh, but readers should beware. Uh, th th this is no Hemingway or Faulkner. So be careful. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> and I you think, got upset. <laughs> yeah, well, no, I got a little something. I was actually happy. I actually went, you know, put this all over, like put it on Twitter, you know, links to the review, and I got a whole bunch of sales from the review because it proves the point. It's a, and I, you know, I'm thinking to myself, Gee, if this is his five star review, I'd hate to see a three star review from this guy. <laughs> but, you know, so, but you know, so, but I think there is a point that I think both both postmen and um popper did not get this point they, they just were very they had very thin skinned and they didn't like to be criticized especially by their students that really rubbed them <laughs> and, and agassi what well, you didn't want to be criticized by agassi you know he knew how to take something apart and, and if somebody ever said to him well, why are you being so tough you know, on that person, you know, his answer was, I'm trying to help them. I'm trying to help them understand that he wasn't wrong. The the the, the, the more precise uh, the criticism and, and even the more intense that it is, the, the better it helps the author uh, or the thinker clarify their ideas. Um, there is one more thing. If I may, I would love to get uh, your uh, opinion on. Um, uh, for me, the, the legacy of Agassi is the importance of dialogue. Uh, he got very upset with how people shout in TV studios and how they shout in the Knesset, in our parliament. And, and um, you know, there is a lot of polarization in politics in the United States and in Israel, and people do not know how to carry on a dialogue. And for me, that is his legacy. Actually, I, I took it um, very much uh, to my heart, and I started some group to create a dialogue um, between uh, different people from different parties and different uh, opinions. Now, a postman taught us about the value of dialogues. And so in a sense, uh, this is something that connects these to people who I miss so much. I miss Postman, I miss, I miss Agassi. Uh, do you have any um, insight regarding a dialogue um, a, a, from the two of them and uh, in what way they, they are similar or they are different? That would be lovely to hear well, from you. Sure. Well, let me first say that um, just from my own life and my own appearances in the media, if you if you look at my YouTube page, you'll see that the I probably have I don't know God knows how many videos up there, but my two most watched videos, one is a debate that I had with this. Uh, after our debate, he got this bard. His name is Jack Thompson. He was he was and still is an anti-video game crusader. He thinks video games destroy kids' minds. I, Postman might have even agreed with him. Who knows? And so I was asked to uh, come on a show here uh, on a uh, station, uh, CNBC. It's uh, NBC's business cable station and have a debate with this guy. It was like six o'clock in the morning. And um, as, as people will see when they watch it, this guy is like constantly interrupting me, but I'm just my usual friendly, happy self because I'm happy to talk to people. And, and that 
video has received, I don't know, like 400, 500,000 views, you know, on YouTube. So there you have an example. A lot of people said to me, why'd you waste your time? You, you, you got up at six o'clock in the morning and, and in those days there was no Zoom. It was like 2005. I had to drive out to the studio in New Jersey to debate this guy, you know, um, and he was interrupting me constantly. And I said, because that's the way people learn and I enjoy it and it's good publicity for me. That's why. And so, you know, so dialogue helps everyone. And, you know, the only one who might not have been happy with the dialogue was this guy, Jack Thompson, uh, because he didn't like when after interrupting me a hundred times, I finally made a point which, you know, he disagreed with. Um, but you know the the other thing uh, about uh, about dialogue, and you know the other point that I think is made clear in the videos that you'll see uh, of me on YouTube is I don't know how many people in Israel you probably do. Rem he's still alive, but he was fired a few years ago. Remember the uh, Fox uh, newscaster Bill O'Reilly. He had a show called The O'Reilly Factor, okay? So again, back in, I don't know, like 2005, 2006, I get invited to go to be a guest, as they call it, on the Bill O'Reilly show. So first of all, everyone and their grandmother is telling me, don't go on the show. You don't want to prostitute yourself and go on the Bill O'Reilly show. And I say, no, I'm going to go on the show. I want to, I'm going to talk to him. Maybe I'll be able to teach these viewers of Fox a few things, you know. So I wound up going on a show about seven or eight times. And, um, you know, the, the, the first time I went on the show, that also has about three or 400,000 views. And, you know, I disagreed with every single point O'Reilly made, but we had a nice conversation. And again, and, and in the case of O'Reilly, he had in those days, you know, he had like six, seven million viewers of his show. I got all kinds of hate mail and stuff like that. Fordham University should fire you. I'm going to write to the president of Fordham University. By the way, Fordham University was so thrilled with the attention that it got, the academic vice president, and again, this was before, you know, it was easy to, to send videos through email. He basically made uh, like 15, 20 copies of the videotape of me on it, and he distributed it to all the deans in the school, saying, this is what you should do if you get invited, you know, to go on the O'Reilly show. So my, my point is, I agree with Agassi completely. Dialogue is is absolutely crucial. The the worst thing that could happen when people disagree over anything, whether it's a big thing, a small thing, is that they don't talk and they, they just like withdraw to their own camp, their own ideas. And that's like the worst possible thing, because when all that you have to consult regarding your own ideas are people who already agree with you. And even worse than that, your own mind, you know, you retreat to your own mind. It's impossible for any progress to be made. The only way progress can be made is when different people with different ideas meet and talk. And um, both, you know, Karl Popper and Winston Churchill uh, you know, agreed on some things. Winston Churchill famously said, jaw, jaw is always better than war, war. And Karl Popper famously said, it's better to kill ideas than people. And in other words, wow. here again, falsification. You know, you disagree with somebody, kill their ideas. You know, show the world that their ideas are wrong, if indeed they're wrong. D don't kill the person, because first of all, that's not going to kill the idea anyway, because somebody else is going to have that idea. So if you want to make progress, kill the idea. I mean, sometimes you have no choice if somebody's attacking you. You have to, you know, use physical violence. But I think that that dialogue, you know, and th this is what 
one of the things that separates human beings from all other species. One of the other things you'll find on YouTube, I think they're adorable, uh, are these videos of, of monkeys. You know, people bring home little baby monkeys, make pets of them, and other people basically, you know, go to the forest and videotape, you know, the monkeys. And, you know, monkeys are a lot like us, and you do see them jabbering away. Um, but they're always getting into fights. You know, if, if, if there's like a piece of fruit and one monkey grabs it, the other monkey doesn't say, hey, can I have a piece of the fruit? The other monkey tries to grab it. And then the two of them get into a fight. And, I, and we too often as human beings act like monkeys. You, you, you have to talk. You have to have dialogue. And I think Joseph Agassi is one of the great proponents of that. And, and, and on the, in this, so was Karl Popper, even though he didn't like being criticized in that dialogue. Wow, this is inspirational and a good way to uh, close our uh, conversation, our dialogue. Yes. Um, well, the problem is that we kind of agreed on almost anything. So uh, maybe we need to find another topic where we can have a debate, <laughs> the two of us. I really enjoyed it very much and I really appreciate it. And um, we will, of course, put it on YouTube and uh, uh, in our uh, management magazine. And I hope that uh, we keep in touch. And uh, um, if it is okay, if people from the Agassi group uh, will ask me uh, and if they would like to be in touch with you or, or it's okay to give them your email, yeah? 100%, okay. Yes, 100%. I'd love to hear from them. Uh, okay. Many of them are actually people who wrote their dissertation uh, with Agassi and they all adore him. They all enjoyed it so much. He was a great mentor, a great teacher. So yeah. is there something that you would like to uh, to to say at the end before we say a uh, goodbye? Yeah, I'll just make this last point. Um, you know, there's, as you know, they've been uh, uh, people have been doing a, um, a a webinar for Karl Popper for the last couple of years, and I guess it was two years ago that, uh, or maybe three years ago, when I went on the webinar and I saw that Joseph Agassi's name was there and I was thrilled. And I actually had a conversation with him just a few years ago, just like you and I are talking. And that was one of the thrills of my life. And let me just say, this is why I have so little patience with people, uh, you know, I'm happy to have a dialogue with them who are so critical of technology. But Joseph Agassi was already in, in, the, in the home that you visited him in, and I was here in New York, and on top of everything else, it was COVID, so nobody could travel. And, um, and, he, and here I was having a conversation with him after all these years, and it, it brought tears to my eyes. I mean, I, I, and I said to my wife, I, I, I had just a wonderful conversation with Joseph Agassi, and she said, you're kidding, how did that happen? And I told her, and, you know, so... Um, I don't know, you know, not to get too far adrift. I don't know, uh, you know, what forces there are in the cosmos that have any control over our lives or whatever. But if there are, I have to thank them or he or she or it, whatever it is, for, for giving me that opportunity because it was a rare and wonderful opportunity. Wow. I, I am so moved because we all feel this way. And to think that you are so far away in the United States and your feelings towards him uh, are just like ours. It's amazing. We all miss him so much. So thank you very much, Paul, for uh, this great dialogue, this great conversation. Uh, and um, uh, let's stay in touch. Absolutely. Many more dialogues, many more conversations. Take care. Best wishes. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Thank bye -bye. you.